AB6-4. Let's do this. Now we're on school G every single grade, and that's the story of the evolution of Wade. Ooh, that school bus sure hurt my back, but I'm here. I made it. Okay, so f of x equals the absolute value of x squared minus 4. All right. We've never graphed anything like this before. We've graphed everything under the sun, if you had me for integrated 3 especially, but also in calculus. But you know what? We haven't graphed the absolute value of x squared minus 4. What the heck does that look like? Okay, step one. Consider just the normal regular equation f of x equals x squared minus 4 without the bars because you all know what that is. I mean, like every person who gets to calculus knows how to graph x squared minus 4. It's a parabola shifted down 4. And if you don't know that, you probably have no business being in calculus. Now, that's a little harsh, but it's actually true. Okay, so parabola down 4. Okay, do a parabola shifted down 4. And let's draw this with um, some dashed lines. Let's not make it solid because it's not the graph we're trying to graph. We're trying to graph the absolute value. So let's actually draw kind of a dashed version of it right there. Okay. And then for the follow-up question, I notice it crosses the x-axis twice. It crosses there and it crosses there. I would kind of like to know what those x-intercepts are because they seem to be extremely important because they divide this parabola into the world of above the x-axis and below the x-axis. And that turns out to be the key to how to graph this correctly. All right, how do you get x-intercepts in any level of mathematics? That's another thing you should probably know or you probably shouldn't be in calculus, right? Because these are things that are talked about in middle school, all right? If you put in a zero for y, you can easily get the x-intercept of any graph. Add four to the other side, or you can probably just guess at this point, isn't it positive and negative 2, what we call plus or minus 2? Sure. All right, negative 2, positive 2. All right, now we got a great graph going on here. That is the graph of x squared minus 4. But wait, that's not the graph of the absolute value of x squared minus 4, is it? What do the bars do to something? The absolute value bars make anything that's negative into a positive. All this U shape that's below sea level down here, it's gonna flip it over and make it positive. Now this one you can darken in. And the mirror image of negative four is positive four. All right, so anything that's negative becomes positive and anything that's above sea level or that was already positive stays positive. Isn't that what absolute value does? So this stays positive and this stays positive. So the absolute value of a positive is a positive or stays the same. The absolute value of a negative switches and changes to opposite. That's what absolute values are all about. Okay, now if you hide that little dashed part, the actual graph of the absolute value of x squared minus four is one of these things, all right? It's kind of like a bull with some horns right here. I think I just wrote on my hair. Okay, now in note 6-3, we graphed something exactly like this before. So you remember the bull with the horns, of course. Um, I don't think we talked about this, though. You can write this as a piecewise function. And I believe we hinted at the fact that it, an absolute value is a piecewise function, usually. So there's one piece here. There's a second piece in the middle that got folded. And then there's a third piece here. So it's a piecewise function with three pieces. x squared minus 4 is describing a typical parabola. This is describing an upside down parabola. And then this is describing a regular parabola. So FYI, maybe in college, not in high school, you could actually write this as a piecewise function. The flipped stuff changes to opposite. The normal stuff just stays normal. Okay, That's the moral of the story. But all right, let's go over here. f prime of 1 is the first question related to this graph. F prime of 1, let's translate that from math to English because you must be fluent to ace calculus. So the translation of that into English is the slope, isn't derivative slope, of f, the original function, at what? x equals 1. 
from that number right there. That is a parenthesis and a one. That looks horrible. Anyway, it's the slope of the curve f at x equals 1. You'll notice 1 is up here. You won't have to draw this on a test, but it's good to get a visual reference today. 1 is on this section right here. That's where the coordinate is. And if you think about this as a roller coaster, the tangent line is negatively sloped here, right? The roller coaster is dropping once it gets past that peak there. So the derivative should be negative, right? Because the tangent slope is negative and because it's decreasing. Well, sure enough, we're going to prove that it's negative. So how do you do it? All right. Here's the problem. And again, I kind of hinted at this last time. I pretty much came out and said it in 6-3. You can't take the derivative of an absolute value. All right, we're out of luck. You can't integrate an absolute value either, but we have ways around that. So, to take the derivative of an absolute value, you first must get it out of the bars. Let's take the number one, which is the only clue we have, and let's test it inside there, okay? I know you're thinking, shouldn't we be plugging this into the derivative? Well, first, we're gonna plug it into the original function just to see what's going on. So if you take one and you test it in the original function, you get one squared minus four, all right? One squared is one, minus four is, I don't care. All I care is that it's negative. I know it's negative three, but I don't care about that. It's a negative. When you take the absolute value of a negative, don't you change the sign? So, x squared minus 4 becomes, without the bars, negative x squared and plus 4. And I guess I'll put like an arrow here. It doesn't really equal that, but it implies. The absolute value of a negative implies that if you want to drop the bars, we'll put a circle there, then you have to change every sign to opposite from the original inside. Okay. So without having to write this whole piecewise mess right here for yourself, you've kind of done a little shortcut there, all right? You've determined that you are at one, and when you're at one, if you don't want to draw this picture on the test, and you definitely don't want to write the piecewise function on the test, you've figured out that you are on the flipped portion of the parabola that flipped up. That's negative x squared plus four. It's also written here. Okay, but again, you don't want to do the piecewise function and graph it and waste all that time. So by slipping the number into the original function, you can determine are you negative inside or are you positive inside? If you're negative inside, I'm going to switch all your signs. If you're positive inside, I'm going to keep you exactly the same, x squared minus 4. Now that you know that we're on the negative x squared plus 4 flipped version of the graph, you can now take the derivative because this underlying function right here, it doesn't have any bars and you can take the derivative of it, okay? So that's what you're going to figure out. Am I switching everything or am I keeping everything the same? And now let's go find f prime of x. Okay, what's f prime of x? The derivative of negative x squared plus 4. 2 comes down, negative 2x drops to the first, derivative of 4 is 0, you're simply looking at negative 2x. Now take 1, plug it in there. f prime of 1 is negative 2. Didn't we say that would be a negative slope? And it works. Okay? So doing a little detective work with the original function will tell you, am I on the flipped version or the regular version? We were on the flipped version. This little central mound right there. Okay? That's what you're doing. Then we have a special case. Okay, here you would want to know that graph. Still don't have to do the whole piecewise thing. I mean, you could, but you shouldn't waste time with that. Just know the bullhorns graph, all right? Take f prime of two. Well, first, first, test two in the original function. I know it goes counter to what you're thinking. You're thinking, shouldn't we be plugging 2 into the derivative? Eventually. But first, test 2 in the original function because this is an absolute value, which is a special thing. f of 2 would be absolute value of 2 squared minus 4. 
which is the absolute value of 4 minus 4, which is the absolute value of 0. Uh-oh, okay, something weird's happening here. But Mr. Wade, the absolute value of 0 is just 0. Well, yeah, that doesn't help you, okay? L just listen to what I'm trying to tell you, all right? Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth, right? We have to understand, when do you get a 0 inside of an absolute value? Didn't we just say that the game was this? If it's negative, switch everything opposite. If it's positive, keep everything the same. I didn't say what to do with zero because it's an exception, okay? If you plug in a number and you come out with the absolute value of zero, you must be on one of the sharp corners. Do you see what x equals two is on the picture? Now see, I've drawn all over it, but it's at the corner of the bullhorns. You've got this, you've got this, and you've got this. You see how two is right on the sharp corner? Okay, you can't take the derivative or find a slope of a sharp corner in calculus. It is impossible, all right? So f prime of two, what is the slope of the graph at two? You have to know the picture, you have to see the sharp corner, and then you say d in e does not exist. The derivative, the slope, will never exist at a sharp corner. Special case, all right? So if it's negative, switch, then take a derivative. If it's positive, keep it the same, then take a derivative. If it's zero, corner, look at the graph, okay? Does not exist. I better tell you this, though, before we go to the next problem. Just because it's zero does not mean it does not exist. Please let me talk about that, all right? Because sometimes when the absolute value equals zero, or when you have the absolute value of zero, sometimes it's not a sharp corner. You can get graphs that flip around, like what about a snake? You know the snake graph, x cubed? What happens if you take x cubed and you flip that around? If you flip it, the negative stuff, you get, I know you're thinking that's a parabola. Well, it's not quite x squared. It's almost x squared, all right? But that could be a smooth fit. Matter of fact, it ends up being smooth, not crooked right there. So it's really about, and, and they wouldn't ask this in high school because this actually gets into writing the, the piecewise function. We're not going to get into that in high school, okay? But if you can visually see a sharp corner on the graph, it does not exist. If it looks smooth on the graph, it's probably not going to pop up in high school, but it does not have to be, does not exist, okay? So at least for your purposes on the test, if it's sharp, it does not exist for the derivative. That's the main thing. All right, now let's go to our blanks. We talked about this in an earlier chapter. A function is considered non-differentiable, fancy word there, when the derivative does not exist. That's all that means, okay? So I want to talk to you about the three places that the derivative does not exist because you'll have to know this as a calculus student. If f, the original function, has a sharp corner, what's the word in calculus for sharp corner? Cusp. That just means a sharp point. If f has a sharp point, or what's called a cusp, the derivative does not exist. Therefore, the original function f is non-differentiable. So this is referring to f right here. Okay? Now, f has a blank. Where else? would the function have a derivative that fails? Okay, what about when you have like a sideways parabola, all right? And you've got like a, a positive tangent line, a positive tangent line, a positive tangent line, but when you get to the side, right on the edge, you get a vertical tangent line, which we talked a little bit about in the implicit chapter actually earlier, okay? If your tangent line goes vertical, everybody learns in middle school that a vertical line has an undefined slope. Then in calculus, you learn that derivative is slope. If you have a vertical tangent line, the slope is non-existent. Therefore, the derivative is non-existent. So the old vertical tangent on the side of a curve, that'll happen a lot. It'll happen with circles this year. The tangent line will go vertical. It'll happen with semicircles, which is part of a circle. 
So technically on the side of a semicircle, the tangent line does go vertical for one split second. Um, even the square root of x, remember the square root of x is like the top half of the parabola? In spirit, it is a full sideways parabola. So even on the side of a square root of x, it's undefined when you get to that endpoint right there. Okay, true statement. So there are all kinds of places we'll see this year um, where this happens. Heck, even the sideways snake, remember the cube root of x? What about cube root of x, right? When you get to the middle of the cube root, there's one split second where the tangent line actually goes vertical. Now you'd have to use the derivative because you probably couldn't see it with the human eye. You can see it on the circles. You can even see it on the sideways parabolas pretty easily. Um, sometimes it might take a little detective work. We'll do that later. So I want you to know that cusps, vertical tangents, and one more thing, three things, calculus comes in threes, one more thing. A derivative is non-existent meaning the original function is non-differentiable. When f is, does not exist. What if the original function doesn't even exist? Then how the heck could its derivative exist, right? The derivative is describing its slope. But if the original function's not even there, you couldn't describe its derivative or slope either, could you? Fancy word for original function does not exist? Not non-differentiable, that's for the derivative. Original function does not exist. Do you remember the word discontinuous? That's the fancy way in math to say does not exist. All right? Now, all this will come back in a later chapter. You'll have a sharp corner and you'll say, oh, that's a cusp. Derivative does not exist. You'll have a vertical tangent sometimes and go, oh, vertical tangent, middle school, undefined, derivative does not exist. And then sometimes the function won't even exist. So the derivative does not exist, which spawns three more things. It's a three things inside of a three things. It's inception, all right? So remember, there are only three ways that a graph, an original function, could be discontinuous. Does anybody remember out there at home? I hope you're yelling a few out at the screen right now. Anybody remember a way that a function can be discontinuous or does not exist? If you said vertical asymptote, correct. If you said hole, anytime there's a hole in the graph, correct. If you said jump, also known as disjoint, correct. We did those in integrated three. Some of you were with me and did them in integrated two, actually. And you're all with me in calculus, and we do them in here as well. All right? So there you go. So those are kind of the three things and then the three things inside the three things. Those are all the ways that a graph can get messed up in calculus. Commit those to memory because we'll go back to those often. All right? Okay, on that note, now let's start figuring some stuff out. Letter B. Find the area between the parabola, negative x squared minus 1, and the horizontal line, y equals negative 5. Okay. We keep hinting in this chapter over and over and over again that integration is basically area. Of course, derivative is actually slope, but we haven't actually set one up ourselves. This is a huge moment in your lives. Setting up your very first exact area of something that's not a rectangle, square, triangle, trapezoid, circle, you know. All right, so here's how we do it. Step one, give me a good graph. You should all know that x squared is a parabola. You should all know that negative x squared is an upside down parabola. And you should all know that the minus one shifts it down one. So let's go down to negative one. Draw me a nice concave down parabola. Easy, right? Y equals negative five. You should all know that Y equals number means horizontal line through negative five. We'll just call that negative five right there. Draw our horizontal line. Do you notice how the two curves enclose a shape? You see this little shape in here? Okay, it's kind of like a little gumdrop, a little dome, all right? And scientists, engineers, many different careers have to find the exact area of that space, all right? That's not something like a triangle that has a handy dandy formula, one half base times height. That's not a circle. It doesn't have a nice formula, pi r squared. It's not a rectangle. It's not base times height. What the heck is it? Thank goodness. Remember number 11, Jean Darbeau, the French mathematician? 
not in the top 100, but anybody who's in the top 500 or even the top 1,000 is amazing, believe me. All right? That's incredible. So Darbo discovered that integration finds area. All right? But what's the connection to this chapter? Remember that area, the way Darbo discovered it, area is simply a stack of vertical distances. Okay, this is so genius. And I really hope some of you out there appreciate this, just how brilliant it is, okay? And I hope it makes very logical sense because once it clicks in your brain, it is so logical, all right? Remember vertical distance earlier in the chapter? Vertical distance is basically just top Y minus bottom Y, okay? What's the upper Y coordinate? Well, it depends on where you are on the parabola. The upper Y coordinate is like varying. It's all over the place. But the upper Y coordinate is negative X coordinate squared minus one. Whatever that gives you, those are your Y coordinates. So the top Y is the parabola minus the bottom Y is permanently negative five. Okay, vertical distance, top Y minus bottom Y. Okay, if you want to add that to your notes, as we did earlier in the chapter, there is so much in calculus that revolves around top Y minus bottom Y. And I do mean revolves when we get into the three-dimensional stuff, by the way, later. So major, major theme, all right? In calculus, top three themes right there. All right, let's simplify it. Negative X squared minus one, minus minus makes a plus five. And that can be simplified to be negative x squared plus 4. Okay, that is the vertical distance from any point directly down to any other point from the parabola to the line. That'll cover all the possible vertical distances. But hold on a second. That's only one single vertical distance at a given place. I want all the vertical distances. The area of that odd shape right there is the integration from left corner to right corner of the vertical distance. I need to find that corner and I need to find that corner. I don't know what points either one of those corners would be, but I need to find them because I'm going to integrate from, let's say, left x to right x. Okay, how far left and right? What are the boundaries of the shape? Every engineer who manufactures something has to know the boundaries of the shape. I've got a friend, Jack, who does these and he uses integration to do these on, on a machine, basically, okay? All right, so left X to right X and then we're just gonna put the vertical distance right in there because what does integration do? What is the big revelation in this chapter? integration has the power to add up an infinite number of things. Can you believe that? Integration is the only thing in the world that'll take infinite little sticks and add them all up together and make a whole shape out of it. It's just amazing. Absolutely amazing. Okay? And then, oh, by the way, at the very end, in this chapter, we're going to put normally dx, occasionally dy. That's coming down the pike here. Even, I think today it's going to come in somewhere, or maybe next time. But dx, because left x to right x is an x type of motion, or like domain back in the integrated classes. Okay? So left x to right x is a dx kind of thing. Later we'll be stacking from low to high, and we'll call it dy. That rhymes. Okay? But for right now we're doing dx. All right. So let's go find these boundaries. Where do these intersection points happen to be? Well, if you take in the ACT and they say something about intersection points, how do you find the intersection between a parabola and a line or the intersection between any two things? Well, when two things are intersecting, that means they're equal to each other. They have the same Y and the same X at the same time. If two things are equal to each other, you just cut out the middleman here and just set them equal to each other. Okay, mathematical fact. When one equation equals another equation, it will give you intersection points. They assume you know that on the, uh, on the uh, ACT, but then that's not even hardly taught in the integrated system thanks to that uh, curriculum, but you know, whatever. 
All right, I'm going to teach it to you. So I don't like the thing I'm solving for to be negative. I like my x squareds to be positive. I would add x squared over to the other side if I were you. And simultaneously add the 5 back over and plus 5 minus 1 is positive 4. And because you're calculus students, you should be able to do two steps in one. Okay? x equals plus or minus 2. Done. Very quick process there. Okay? and be able to keep your x squared positive. I don't want to see anybody adding one to the other side. That's sloppy and it leads to mistakes. I've seen it too many times. All right, plus or minus two. I'm kind of harsh today, aren't I? I need to mellow out. Okay, so plus or minus two. The negative two aligns to that corner. I guess the positive two aligns to the right corner. That makes sense. So the shape only exists from negative two to positive two. Those are my so-called limits of integration, all right? My boundaries. So the area of the gumdrop in real life is the integration from negative two to positive two. And then you're physically going to integrate whatever you wanna stack. I wanna stack vertical distance formula over and over and over again all the way across, okay? Bunch of little vertical distances. The vertical distance we found out was negative x squared plus 4. You simply integrate the vertical distance from left to right. That, that's all you have to do in real life. And it took Jean Darbo until the 1870s to figure that out. It took the human race until the 1870s to figure this out. And boy, did things change after that. Now, negative 2 to positive 2. Left to right, that's an x kind of direction, not a y kind of direction. If it's an x kind of direction, it's a dx. Okay, the direction of your, your numbers indicates what kind of d you're going to use. Again, normally dx, but we will see some dy's later. Okay, all right, that integral is great. You want a shortcut? Who doesn't want a good shortcut, right? Because the gumdrop is a mirror image of itself. It has symmetry, right? If it's symmetric, then guess what? Instead of integrating from negative two to two, which is fine, you can do that if you want, I would rather do this. Let me make a little space, put this on your notes wherever you can fit this in. A better way to write the area would be this. Could I integrate from zero to two and double it? Hey, what if we double the area from 0 to 2 and then keep your vertical distance in there the same? Negative x squared plus 4 dx. So occasionally, it doesn't happen often, but occasionally you see a nice symmetric image and you can simply integrate halfway and double it. And we're about to integrate this, by the way. We're going to find the area because it says find the area on the sheet. When I integrate this, this is going to be very easy to integrate, by the way. This is an easy problem now. This is just a review problem from calculus. But I would much rather plug in a 0 than a negative 2. I'm just saying. All right? So 2 stays. The integration of negative x squared is add 1 to the power, negative x cubed, over the new power, 3. Plus, what's the integration of 4? 4 x evaluated from 0 to 2 because once you integrate you drop the integral you drop the dx you physically integrated now and then this is remember called a definite integral plug in the top plug in the bottom subtract 2 plug in the top number 2 cubed is 8 then put the negative on it negative 8 thirds plus 2 times 4 is 8, okay, that's the top number, minus 2, still carries, times, plug in the bottom number. Now you got lucky, 0 plus 0 is 0, but you don't always get 0 when you plug in 0. We see cases where students make assumptions and they forget, oh, 0 actually mattered this time, okay, be careful. All right. And now we're going to do 2 times negative 8 thirds plus, 
Let's disguise this eight. Isn't eight the same thing as 24 thirds, right? Three times eight is 24 times tables. And two times zero, gone. Get a common denominator. Add those two together. I keep running out of space. I need like the magic erasing board here. Two times 24 minus eight, easier in your head. 24 minus eight is 16 over three. Okay, times two, that is two over one, so the two only affects the 16. You'd be surprised how many calculus students I've seen in the past that did two to the 16 and to the three. Oh, no, no, no. Nope, two times 16 is 32. One times three is three. You're done, 32 thirds. Thank you, Jean Darbo. And if you remember what we talked about earlier with the article about Archimedes and the special Archimedes method and all that stuff, Archimedes knew that area 2,000 years before any other human being, which makes him, I don't know, an alien from another planet? Like, I mean, how in the world, right? But remember Archimedes used a secret two-thirds in his parabola calculations? You can see the two-thirds. As a matter of fact, you can kind of see it right here. Two-thirds times 16. Archimedes knew that in the BC era. How? It's one of the biggest mysteries of mathematics. You know, it's just incredible. Okay, so final answer, 32 thirds. All right, back page. And here we see a little bit of trigonometry. Well, well, well. All right. You better know your sine and cosine graphs, right, for this class. Okay, we're going to find the area trapped, enclosed by cosine, but a modified cosine, 3x over 2 kind of cosine. The coordinate axes, notice that's the plural of axis. So it's both the x and y axes, and the first quadrant only. Okay, let's draw the shape. Do you know what a cosine graph looks like? You better, because it does not hit the origin like the sine graph, does it? Kind of does one of these. Now it is a modified cosine, don't worry about that yet. Just draw yourself the basic kind of cosine curve. Okay. I don't know where this crossing is. I know where the cosine graph crosses, but not the cosine of 3x over 2. We know where the cosine of x crosses. So right now that's unknown. This is 0. We know that. We know we're looking for the space that touches the cosine curve, the axes plural, so y-axis, x-axis, curve, only first quadrant. This is the only region that I just shaded in that simultaneously touches the x-axis, the y-axis, the curve, and is in the first quadrant, okay? So that's how you narrow down what we're even looking at. Give, give yourself a visual. All right, now, find that question mark because that's one of your boundaries right there. The top equation is the cosine equation. The bottom equation, what's the equation of the x-axis? y equals zero, well, that's a fact. How do you find the intersection point between two curves. Set them equal to each other. Cosine of 3x over 2 equals 0. Okay? Um, also, an alternative way to get that. Isn't this just simply an x-intercept? Wait a minute. How do you get x-intercepts? We just did it today. Plug in 0 for y. So that's another way to get the same to the same place, right? Same results. Okay. We talked about this. Oh, this was on the last test. Cosine of my hand equals zero. What can I put in place of my hand to make this a true sentence? Well, let's set the three X over two on the shelf over here. That doesn't matter yet. Okay. Cosine of blank equals zero. Cosine of what equals zero? What's the normal crossing of the cosine graph? The usual crossing of cosine of X is pi over 2, isn't it? Right? I could put pi over 2 in place of 3x over 2. I could swap that in its place. I could write it on top of my hand and cosine of pi over 2 equals 0. That's true. But we've got to figure out what the modification is. If 3x over 2 can be replaced by x over 2 to be a true sentence, and if anybody wants to get rid of 3 over 2 in one step, how about multiplying both sides by the reciprocal? What a smart move that is. It's a double cross cancellation. I love those. 
It's x equals, and over here we have a single cross cancellation, pi over 3, okay? So this modified cosine graph is not going to cross at pi over 2 like it normally does. It's going to cross at pi over 3. So you actually, and that's actually like number uh, 15, I think it was, or whatever the last question was on the last test. It's a lot like that right there. Good review question. It's kind of why we did it too, okay? And now you get pi over 3. Okay, let's set up the area of the shaded region. All right, area equals the integration or infinite stack, infinite sum from 0 to pi over 3. And then what are we stacking? What is the integral infinitely stacking? Each vertical distance. What is the vertical distance? Top y minus bottom y. What is the top y? Whatever cosine of 3x over 2 will allow it to be. Minus, what is the bottom y? Permanently 0. All the bottom y coordinates are right on 0. Or just use that equation, y equals 0 right there. What is 0 to pi over 3? It's a dx direction. We haven't done any dy direction yet. Okay? All right. Drop the 0. Drop the funny business. Now, is this a setup or is this a find? If it's a find the area, go ahead and integrate it. Sometimes you'll see set up the area and you can just stop and leave it as an integral. Okay? It'll say set up the area as an integral. That's, that's an AP test question sometimes. If you look at the sheet, it says find the area. All right. Well, let's just make sure we know how to do our integration still. Don't forget all your integration skills I taught you this year because we're going to use them for the rest of the year. What's the integration of cosine? Well, the derivative of cosine is negative sine. So the integration of cosine is positive sine of 3x over 2. All right, I guess that's it. I guess I'll go to my podium of bad ideas. Wait a minute, hold on, wait, Mr. Wade. You forgot the most important part of integration. Divide by the chain rule. What is the chain rule or the derivative of 3x over 2? Let's put this off to the side. What is the derivative of 3x over 2? I think you all would feel better if you looked at it as 3 over 2 and you shove the x off to the side because side means top in math. Oh, the derivative of 3 over 2x? Oh, that's easier. See, students sometimes struggle with this one, but they love this one. The derivative of number x is number. 3 over 2. Bingo. Divided by the chain rule, the derivative, 3 over 2. Okay? Evaluated from 0 to pi over 3. It's just that simple. And you can get real life things that are manufactured and find the area and eventually find the volume. We'll do that later. Real life math right here. Doesn't get much more real life than this. Okay. Keep change flip. Instead of dividing by 3 over 2, I'm going to multiply by 2 thirds in front as a coefficient. Evaluated from 0 to pi over 3. We're going to do f of the top minus f of the bottom. All right, top, 2 thirds, sine, 3, oh, now be careful here. 3 over 2. If you put pi over 3 into x, your pi over 3 will be up in the numerator. You're not supposed to have a fraction in a fraction. That's not allowed. Didn't we just talk about shoving that x off to the side a second ago? You see this right here? You see that x up there? Shouldn't we shove it off to the side and then replace it with pi over 3? Does everybody see the advantage right there? Think of that x on the side because people get confused when they put fractions on top of fractions. You just end up confusing yourself. Okay, minus two-thirds again, sine, plug in zero. Zero times three over two is zero. Okay, cross-cancel the threes. You get the sine of pi over two. Know your sine graph. What's the sine of pi over two? Here's just your basic sine of x right here. The sine of pi over two is a peak, and all peaks are worth 1. So that is sine of pi over 2 is 1. 
minus two thirds times sine of zero. Origin, zero. We have quite a streak here of plugging in zero and coming out with zero. That's not always gonna happen though. But that's, this does drop because it's been dropping out a lot recently, hasn't it? All right, just be prepared because it won't always. Two thirds times one is two thirds. And two thirds is the area of that shaded, I almost went to this one. This one, no, this one. That shaded region right there is exactly two thirds of a square or something. I don't know if this is square inches, square feet, square miles, they didn't tell us, I didn't tell you, but it's two thirds square units of something. Letter D, y equals one over x, an equation from your past. If you had me for integrated three, we had a whole chapter discussing direct and inverse relationships and cigarette smoking goes up, your health goes down. And exercise goes up, your health goes up. And this whole chapter that we had. And in that chapter, we discussed that y equals 1 over x is the graph of a hyperbola. And it's even been drawn for you. Now, something you need to know, though. A hyperbola is two pieces. But you need to put this on the graph yourself if it's not there. It has a vertical asymptote on top of the y-axis and a horizontal asymptote on top of the x-axis, the cross of asymptotes. We used to talk about that all the time, all right? So everybody must know that one over x is a hyperbola. You better know your graphs, just your basics, just your basic graphs, not anything crazy, all right? This is a very basic graph that everybody must know by the time they even get to pre-calculus. All right, in the first quadrant, we've got a shaded region that is bounded by the x-axis, 1 over x, k, and 10. Or x equals k and x equals 10. All right, great. So let's, by the way, you may notice the way I said that. This is a calculus term. It's bounded by all those. Uh, that It's not bound because bound is like the past tense of bind, all right? That's not what we're talking about. It's bounded. This is one of the rare times you actually use bounded, actually, in English. Okay? Kind of interesting there. Kind of cool. All right. So, here we go. How would I find that area? The integration is area. The integration from k to 10, left to right, of vertical distance, top y minus bottom y. And the integral will simply stack all those little vertical distances. It's so amazing how that, that works. It makes sense. How did it take until the 1870s for the human race to discover this? Well, because Sir Isaac Newton and Leibniz had to figure out all the, the groundwork for calculus. And then Bernoulli had to come up with the integral symbol. And then Riemann had to come up with the idea for infinite rectangles. And so there's a lot of development that goes into it. I know it seems easy to calculus students now, but a lot of development had to happen from the late 1600s to the late 1800s. 200 years of development that actually led to led from the first calculus to finding area. That's a, that's a long span we're putting into one school year, isn't it? All right, so k to 10, top y, 1 over x, the hyperbola, minus the lower y's or the bottom y, x-axis zero with a dx to match the k to 10 direction all right the integration of 1 over x drop the zero the integration of 1 over x is special isn't it it's the natural log of the absolute value of x evaluated from k to 10 all right what's the next step we have to take plug in the top Plug in the bottom. Natural log absolute value of 10 minus natural log absolute value of k. All right, that's about as far as you can go, except for the other piece of information that's on the paper. You're an engineer and you're manufacturing some shape that fits this size right here. Your boss tells you this bottle, this water bottle must hold this much water or this, this cup has to hold this much volume so that people can measure and make recipes or whatever it is. So your boss tells you this must hold exactly, what does it say on the paper? 
natural log of five, whatever decimal that is to an engineer, they would care about the decimal, of course. But this must hold exactly natural log five worth of steel, plastic, aluminum, whatever it is, all right? Find how to adjust K so that you get exactly natural log of five for the area. This time I give you the area, you give me the K. I'm your boss, you're the engineer. Well, boss, I just integrated and I figured out all this stuff right here, but you told me that it has to equal the natural log of five. So I'll just set what we found so far equal to the natural log of five. Great. And now I just have to solve for K in a pretty easy equation. Now, I don't like it when the thing I'm solving for is negative, remember? I like to keep my natural logs of K positive. Add this to the other side. Make it natural log of absolute value of k. Don't get sloppy and try to subtract that natural log 10 over there. That's, that's amateur, all right? The professionals do it this way. Add this over. Simultaneously, do two steps in one. You're smart enough. Subtract the natural log of 5 back over away from k. It has nothing to do with k. So natural log of, do we all know the absolute value of 10? It's just 10, right? Subtract the natural log of 5 over. Okay, and now you have your k term positive, you dropped the bars, you got all the non-k's over here and all the k's over here, now you're set. One thing you have to remember from integrated three in pre-calculus, otherwise you'll be stuck and you won't get an answer here. The subtraction of natural logs makes division. It's a rare place in mathematics where you can take the subtraction of two things and just fuse it together like that with division. It does happen in several places. And that's equal to the natural log of the absolute value of k. And 10 divided by 5, isn't that just 2? So the natural log of 2 equals the natural log of the absolute value of k. All right. And now finally, you can get rid of natural logs, as you all know, by using E's. But you don't even have to use E's. Now, you can. Some students prefer this. Again, I've taught this, this calculus stuff for 30 years, so I know what students prefer. And I know that a lot of students like to just put the E in there and cancel it out. Okay, great. But you didn't have to do that, okay, if you want a shortcut. If the natural log of 2 equals the natural log of something, then the natural logs don't matter and you're really just saying two equals the something, all right? It's pretty simple. So you don't even have to cancel out the natural logs. Just realize, hmm, what can I plug in for K to make this a true sentence? Two things, actually. The absolute value of two is yes, two, but what else? The absolute value of negative two is also positive 2. So plus or minus 2 is perhaps your answer. Or is it? Is plus or minus 2, are they both valid answers? Is this really the answer? Sometimes yes. We have a lot of plus or minus answers in math, in calculus especially. But sometimes no. How do you know if they're both valid or not? Well, sometimes, sometimes I give you the stipulation. K must be greater than zero. Oh, just keep the two. Sometimes they give you the stipulation that K must be less than zero. Oh, keep the negative two. But I didn't give you any stipulation. I did give you a graph though. Could K be positive two in the graphical sense? If K is two, yes, I can integrate from two to 10, no problem. Could K be negative two? Let's put that over here. It sounds like I'm Doc Brown from Back to the Future all of a sudden. Great Scott. All right, what if, I don't know how I turned into Doc Brown, but what if negative two is a possible answer? Does this shape go from negative two to 10? I mean, you could pull the bar all the way back there, but there's one glitch we talked about today the three types of discontinuity. Vertical asymptotes, holes, jumps. Not horizontal asymptotes. Horizontal asymptotes are not a disruption in continuity, believe it or not, but vertical asymptotes are. 
you cannot integrate at this level of calculus across a does not exist, across a discontinuity. You're not allowed to integrate from negative two to 10 across a vertical asymptote. Now, if you get into, you know, if you ever take Calc 2 and you get into some of that stuff, in Calc 2, there's a way around it. But at this level, even though there is a way around it in the future, you still say negative two would be completely invalid for an area. You can't do area like that. Okay, so if you hit a discontinuity, don't use negative two. The final answer is k equals positive two. Okay, and by the way, had there not been a vertical asymptote, if the, if the curve had just been smooth all the way through with no disruptions, then plus or minus two would have both counted as valid answers. It's just when it's broken up that you can't do it. All right, so just make sure you watch out for that because in the future, it could be a nice continuous curve and you keep both answers. Okay, that'll do it for that section. Go do your homework.